Hey, whoa, Mr. Lally, the voice of wisdom, what did you say? What do we call that when we do it with a knife? Oh, I got a D word. What did you say? My dear wife. If you were to put a function of the word of God on verse number 12, you would say dissect. I mean, that, if you, I mean, you read it, it's, it's dividing a center of the soul and spirit. You know, it's a discerner of thoughts. And, you know, it is separate. It is, oh, see, if I would have done that, you would have gotten it, wouldn't have you? The, see the frog up there? Okay, it was a little tip, little idea here. It's a, the word of God dissects us, according to this verse. It is a dissecting scalpel. When I carefully give attention to words and meanings in my devotion time, time alone, preaching the word of God, I come to church, go to Sunday school, I hear the preacher, whatever, the word of God cuts and divides me into areas that normally are hidden. Isn't that good? Areas that you wouldn't normally see, callous places, denial places, places that are, are, are deep and hidden from in the past and deep and hidden with habits and deep down in, in the places that maybe I only think about. The Word of God is a dissecting scalpel. Amy and I were talking before we came tonight. We were getting ready, and we were talking about how do you really think that you are, I told you I'd mess it up. Do you really think that uh, you are the person you think you are? You know, we have this impression of who we are. are do you think you're really that person? She brought up the idea of, of uh, the people that, the, that what other people think that you are. You cannot trust yourself of who you've judged yourself to be. You certainly can't trust the others, other people's impression of you. Some people will have an impression of you that's too high, and some of you will have an impression of someone that is very low, okay? So you can't trust others' impressions of you. You can't trust your own impression of you. Whose impression of you can you trust? There you go. Jalus says Bible. It's verse 12. It discerns me and compares me to the Bible itself. I can get a valid a, a, a judgment on who I am only by comparing myself to how I'm matching up, keeping the commands of the word of God and keeping and becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And uh, so that's, sometimes that's a very hard evaluation and you need others to help you. Some of you would see, think you're doing great when you're not doing good and some of you would think that you're not doing good and you're doing great, okay? Sometimes we need maybe help in that. But the word of God is the only trustworthy thing to match myself against. It's, it's what dissects me. So tonight let's do some dissecting. We're going to do some dissecting concerning myself myself i've dissected i think a frog and i think i've dissected a worm and you you cut those things open and you divide up you know and if you've ever done that in science class you you move things aside on a piece of paper or cardboard so that, that you can see the different parts okay let's just dissect ourselves and identify this tactics within ourselves that are elusive sinful tactics you can call them habits you can call them things that that are common to me and to you of our self that deceives us and that are elusive and maybe we can't see within ourselves. I hope to identify some of them. Turn back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, we are going to go to the first place where sin erupts in the Bible. There is a rule that some theologians hold to, and maybe they probably preach it a little bit harder than they should, but it's called the, the rule, the law of first mention. Has anybody heard of that? Has anybody heard of that? Okay, you know, you know, maybe, maybe there's some truth to it. In some passages, there really seems to be some truth to it. Maybe not. But, but basically, it goes like this. The first time that a, a big teaching appears in Scripture, that the Lord puts within that story a whole lot of information to be able to recognize it or to be able to help us to understand it the whole way through the Bible. So the first time that something is mentioned, there's a lot of, a lot of teaching in it or a lot of things that are very applicable or revealing there. Let me give you, for instance, in the same passage, there is a first, uh, a first revelation. In verse number 15 is the first revelation in your Bible of the gospel. In Genesis 3.15, in there, we're told of the sin of man, we're to told about Satan, and we're to to told about that someday a redeemer would come. There's a lot of stuff there in verse 15. That's not where we're going. We're going in verse number 5. Here's the fall of man. Listen as I read. For God uh, doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, Satan says, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, 
A tree desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof. There is the first committed sin by humanity. And did eat and gave unto also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the, thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, It was my wife. The man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman, blame shifted again, and said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Here is the first time that sin entered into humanity. I don't know if we understand the full impact of this, but there are several things here, a few things tonight that I would like to begin that show you about your, the tactics of your inner self. And I hope the Word of God will divide not only this story and not only put the scalpel on Adam and Eve, but on your own heart. Notice, first of all, the Bible says about concerning the first tactic or the first thing that self does within us is it mishandles biblical guilt. It mishandles the realization when we've done wrong. Notice in verse number 7, it says their eyes were open. Now, what does that mean? You can go into all kinds of things, and you can talk about all kinds of things, but basically it, it means they knew what was right, and they knew the knowledge of wrong, too. We call that guilt. We call it guilt when we understand when we've done right, and we understand we didn't, when we've done something wrong. It is the recognition of sin, guilt is, right and wrong within them. Well, how did they handle the guilt? I don't know that there's, I don't know what the right way at this point. I mean, obviously, transparency and immediately going to God would have been the right thing. But God has created, created at that very moment when sin came, the guilt within their what? Starts with a C. All right, Jiminy Cricket says, let your conscience be your grand guide. All right, that's not right. But the conscience immediately that God had created within them, bang, for the first time, bang, guilt came. He creates that conscience within each of us that tells us general things about right and wrong. In addition to that, the believer has something else that fires up his conscience about guilt. And what is that? Or who is that? That gave it away. The Holy Spirit, he's got uh, electric cables to your conscience, and he's, you know, he pushes it when he wants to deal with something. The Holy Spirit was given the ministry of conviction in my conscience when I do wrong. It is, a, it is possible, though, to teach your conscience skewed things. Do you know that? It's, it's, it's possible to distort your conscience. I used to listen to WOEL in the mornings, uh, especially when we were, we were in the old building, to Dr. Bob Sr. And Dr. Bob Sr. would always, he would bring up this, this issue of a, of a distorted conscience this way. He would talk about Catholic guilt, all right? And what he would say was, the Catholic feels very guilty if they don't go to Mass. But obviously, that's not something that the Holy Spirit or the Bible is doing. It's possible for you to distort your, your conscience into feeling guilty about things that are not really biblical or not really the Holy Spirit. There is also traditional Baptist guilt, isn't there? That is not biblical or not so biblical. We should be discerning and not concern ourselves. Now, listen to me clearly, because I'm going to sound like I'm contradicting myself. We should, we should be careful that our guilt is true Holy Spirit Bible guilt. That when something is pricking our conscience, if it is something that is in the Bible, that's the Holy Spirit. If it's something that's man-made, yeah, that's tradition. Okay, that may be, that is a, a, a Baptist guilt thing, okay? However, now here's where I'm switching gears. We need to make sure that our guilt is biblical and from the Holy Spirit, but when it comes, when our conscience makes us guilty or responds to guilt, we need to be sensitive to the Lord opening our eyes to what it is that we are doing that dishonors Him or something that we are not doing that does not honor Him. And that guilt, though, in the 21st century, the whole... Our whole culture is to live guilt-free. Don't worry about anything. Do whatever you want. Okay? Believers, modern believers, must not adopt this philosophy. We must understand 
that when God opens our eyes to something and we're convicted about